dear Professor Rollett, dear Professor Kestens, um, dear audience, colleagues, um, ladies, gentlemen, here and also the audience um, online. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Patrick de Baas. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture here at Ghent University. And um, I have to excuse two, uh, two persons. Um, first, the chairman of the Franqui um, Foundation, um, Pierre van Moelbeke. He couldn't make it for today and he is excused. And last minute, unfortunately, our rector uh, is also excused. So he cannot be here and uh, he apologizes for that. For me, it's a true honor uh, to be able to welcome you all here um, to open this, uh, call it a solemn session and inauguration of the Franqui chair in the presence of, um, well, um, numerous sympathizers here and online and interested people. It's a pleasure, but on the other hand, it feels a little bit strange to have to open a chair, a chair of um, 2020, 2021. It is as if I'm a year too late, uh, actually. Um, well, since the chairholder uh, will be talking about 50 years of materials research, I'm only making a 2% mistake, uh, not worth talking about. Uh, the people who know me know that generally I make larger mistakes than 2%. Uh, has material research been done at our faculty of engineering and architecture for 50 years? Uh, well, yes, we have been doing that for 100 years. Um, I just checked it in 1921, so one, 100 years ago almost, um, the Laboratory of Metallurgy, Siderurgy and Physical Metallurgy was founded and its first director was Victor Renault. And that was an alumnus of the University of Liège. And I just met some people from Liège, so um, I'm very glad that uh, the Liège colleagues of Victor Renault are here. And that man was specialized in ferrous metallurgy. And since then, there have been uh, numerous evolutions, of course, in the field of materials research. Non-ferrous metallurgy made its appearance and it's also worth mentioning here that Emile Franqui, that's the man that you see there, that uh, Emile Franqui, after whom this chair is named, was a director at Union Minier. Union Minier, that, that's a company today called uh, Umicor, one of Belgium's leading companies in the non-ferrous sector. Ceramics and polymers came later uh, at the faculty. Today, ver various aspects of these materials are studied uh, and still a lot of attention is paid to the structure and the properties of these materials. And the promoter of our Frank Heath chair, Professor Leo Kestens, is very active in that field. How to make an adequate choice of materials in design of components and products is also taught, uh, taught at our university. And finally, production techniques, and that's one of the topics of today, are examined in order to be able to make the most diverse products in an economically justified and versatile manner. And 3D printing, obviously, is one of these recent production techniques. And Professor Rollet will probably explain us why 3D printing is more than what Germans would call Spielerei and more than a buzzword. Um, I won't say too much about our new uh, Franqui chair. I will leave that to the promoter. I will leave that to Professor Kestens. Um, however, I would like to stress the importance of the international Franqui chair for our faculty. Not only does it enable our students to come into contact with renowned foreign scientists, but it also promotes cooperation between Belgian universities. And I deliberately said Belgian universities. After all, the Franqui Foundation is one of the only few institutions left in our country that still promote cooperation across regional, uh, between Flanders and Wallonia borders. It's precisely for that reason that the importance of the Franqui Foundation cannot be overstated. After all, it is the dialogue and the cooperation across regional and national borders that leads to mutual understandings. 
in science, but also in other areas. And let it be the lack of such understanding that gives rise to so many conflicts and to almost inhuman situations we are experiencing today. I'm very grateful to the Franqui Foundation for the connecting work it does. And I'm also very happy and proud that our faculty can welcome an international Franqui chair. And I'm also particularly glad that this is possible in the so-called code yellow. It's a, a new concept. For a long time, it looked as if the session would have to take place entirely online. But the combination, you know it, uh, the combination of high vaccination level, government measures that were of followed, let's say, quite well here uh, by our population, also at our university, by the way, the daily monitoring by many scientists, and finally, a favorable evolution of the virus made an on-campus organization possible. And I'm glad that Professor Kessin took up this challenge and with his staff made every effort um, to receive Professor Rowlett and all of you in the best and the most beautiful uh, conditions. And now trying to steal part of the speech of our rector. Um, and what is he saying? Well, everything that I have said. And he just adds one detail. He says, I was told that there is a quite surprising story related to the choice of Professor Rowland for the domain of material science. That's what the rector said. A wonderful story of one particular passion unintendedly leading to another one. Dot, dot, dot. I leave it up to you to share this wonderful story that he's addressing words to you, Professor Wallet, this wonderful story with the audience whenever you think it's appropriate to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, I know the story. I won't reveal it. Uh, I will leave it to Professor Rowlett, but I first give him the floor for his uh, uh, Franqui chair introduction and lecture. Enjoy your uh, stay here, and I hope we, I'm sure we will have a very, very exciting speech. Professor Wolde, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a really surprising pleasure to be here that I actually got on a plane, got across the Atlantic, landed, came through all of the usual gates and arrived as if it was 2019 or something. So, so I, I am deeply honored to be a recipient of the Frankie Chair. This is quite a remarkable thing to be. Uh, I freely admit I did not know about it until I started talking to Professor Kestens about it. So it's very interesting. And I think your point about building bridges um, across different regions um, in, um, in Belgium is, is a it's an, an interesting and important point. Um, we don't have quite that problem in the US, but we have, there are some analogous issues, let's say, mainly between cities and rural places these days. Um, you can see that I owe a debt of gratitude to many people. I will try to remember to acknowledge them as we go through. Um, there isn't <coughs> time to tell you everything about what we do. But the next manufacturing center was something that we set up a few years ago <coughs> to try to reach out, particularly to industry, and to help them get going with additive manufacturing. And that was a, a remarkable experience. I've never talked to so many companies in a very short space of time. The other thing I need to remember to say is, why did I pick 50 years? Well, that has a much larger slot than the 5% <laughs> that, that your dean mentioned. Um, <coughs> What I'm remembering is that back a long time ago, there was a great deal of activity in rapid solidification. People like Paul Dewey's and many others put a lot of time and effort into it. And that we learned a lot of material science from it, but it didn't lead to any technology. 
And so that's the remarkable thing for me about metals additive manufacturing is that we're actually combining rapid solidification with making real parts. And so I'm going to do my best to cover that entire gamut. So let's keep going. Um, I owe, con as I said, considerable debt of gratitude to my group and many collaborators, many supporters. But this is perhaps the moment to say a couple of words about diversity, um, which is sadly a very contentious subject, in the, at least in my own country, in the US. Um, and two examples of this. Um, the, the, um, there was a very famous material scientist called Julia Whitman, who actually got her, I think at least her undergraduate degree from my own institution, from what was Carnegie Tech. And she told me one time that she interviewed with the Dean of Engineering, who told her quite emphatically that women don't do engineering. That was in 1954 or something. So she did physics instead. Now, she may have gotten a better education in certain respects, but that's what she had to do. So we've come a reasonable distance, and I'm happy about that. But it's not that many generations ago. And the, the other um, contentious item is um, the attitude and what happens to um, um, people from certain ethnic backgrounds, particularly people of color. And all I can tell you about that is I've asked everybody who will talk to me, and they basically universally say, yes, um, you know, microaggressions and things like this are a reality that they have to live with. So it's been an interesting journey, I have to say. Okay, so first of all, something that's a kind of philosophy of approach. So what I want to explain here is something that most of you are probably not so familiar with, <coughs> but about eight years ago, we had quite a discussion about mesoscale science. And to some of us, this seemed obvious, and then to others, it turned out to be not obvious at all. So uh, my colleague, George Crabtree from Argonne National Lab, made an effort to put together this slide. And the point of this slide is that many of us pursue what's essentially a reductionist approach. We start with a phenomenon and we work our way down in an effort to try to understand um, the causes of it or what controls it and so on. But there's a good sentiment, a lot of sentiment, that one ought to be able to build up. One ought to be able to start with the atoms or the electronic structure and work our way up to understanding all of the natural phenomena that, that particularly we as material scientists deal with. And so you think, oh, well, that's a very, um, that's certainly the right thing to do. But the point of mesoscale science is that if you look at certain kinds of um, objects, defects in particular, and let's take dislocations as one example, what we know is that we know a lot about the properties of individual dislocations, but when we try to model what's going on with dislocations as populations of dislocations, we discover that we have to use heuristic approaches, empirical approaches. So there's a gap there that we haven't, at least we certainly haven't fully bridged. So in the context of additive manufacturing, um, we can start with trying to characterize defects in the bulk. I won't have time to talk about coherent diffraction, but it's a pretty interesting technique. Um, I'll show you some examples of characterizing what happens during laser melting, in other words, high-speed visualization. Um, we also do a lot of diffraction work. There won't be time for that this afternoon. That will come in some of the later lectures, I think. Um, but we certainly take an interest in the microstructures and these already have several puzzles, and I will try to explain a couple of the more obvious puzzles as we go through. And then many of the alloys that we would like to use, many of the high strength aluminum alloys, for example, unfortunately have this phenomenon of hot cracking. And so we've been trying to understand that as well. Um, and then if you want to map things in three dimensions, then synchrotron radiation is once again extremely useful. That will have to wait for a later lecture. But I will show you some examples of printed heat exchangers, high temperature heat exchangers. An, an, an article, a component that is only accessible through 3D printing. So it's, it makes a nice example of something that's uniquely 
dependent on this technology as well as the underlying science. And then from a, a discussion this week with Leo, um, we, we realized that two of the classic textbooks in our field sort of represent the, the yin and the, and the yang of this, that Ashby's approach tends to be, well, let's start with some, some engineering problem and let's work our way down to the level that we need to understand it. And by contrast, if you go with Callister's book, it's really inverted. It's more like the constructionist approach. We start with the atoms and, and so on and try to work our way back up the tree. Sometimes successfully, sometimes I would assert less so. So I leave you with that as a sort of a high level approach to um, how at least I try to fit some of these things together. Okay, so, um, and I need to badly need to keep an eye on the time. Uh, let's talk about why 3D printing of metals or a little tiny bit of history. Um, so some of you probably know that this goes back to about 1980 or so. And so what happened was that people, for example, at University of Texas in Austin, they developed these machines, they got some patents on them, and patents take typically 15 years to run. And so that actually was very successful for polymers, but it kind of held up the, the business of printing with metals. So as I understand the story, there came a point in time when enough of these patents had expired that companies could now start to offer particularly powder bed machines <coughs> and allow this kind of printing to take place. Now, I'm a newcomer to this. I, I only started working with this about six, seven years ago, maybe. And so when I first encountered this, I discovered that it was mostly existed in the domain of mechanical engineering, which seemed fair enough. It was mostly about the machine control. And people were happy just to print parts that had the correct dimensions. But if you look at this as a material scientist, you say, it's just welding. And if any of you have had any contact with welding, you tend to think immediately, oh, then they're going to be defects. And so I just took the, the approach of, let's go look for the defects. And they were all over the place, mainly porosity. And it turned out that there was porosity even in the powders being used. And as a little sort of anecdote, uh, we were very unpopular in the powder metallurgy business for a little while because they, they hadn't appreciated that most of their powders actually had a significant um, porosity fraction. And the reason that it hadn't been an issue was they had always cold pressed, hot pressed, hipped their, their parts. They'd never just taken the powder and melted it and resolidified it, which allows some of this porosity to survive. So there you have something that was at least a little bit counterintuitive that we ran across pretty, pretty early on. So some background to this and um, you know, what is basically what is additive competing against. Well, certainly for the larger parts, it's competing against things like casting. Well, that's another um, technology that introduces defects and, um, and has to be allowed for. Um, you can do welding and joining, but welding and joining was never really oriented until we got into AM. And I'm going to use AM rather liberally for additive manufacturing um, until rather recently. And then most parts have to be machined. And indeed, many parts have to be machined to remove a very large fraction of the original piece of metal. So there was at least the attraction of being able to do things, make much more efficient use of material before having to recycle. Um, so what is additive? Well, I'm guessing this is pretty obvious to most of you. Um, you're, you're taking um, the design that you have, the CAD design, you're taking some powder, at least in the case of powder bed, and you're making a part that is um, more or less or something close to the exact shape, sorry. Um, and so there are a number of obvious benefits. You have considerable freedom of design. I'll come back to that. You don't have any tooling costs. The tooling is all in the computer and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, we're going to hear that it's a rather expensive technology. And so you're really, this is really oriented at low volume and complex parts. So again, just to um, illustrate what many of you know, on the left is a basic diagram of how a typical powder bed machine is set up. Spread a layer of powder, use the laser to melt, not center, melt where you want it. And then 
the part is effectively sliced in the computer, and then you, you melt, you fuse in place each layer, one layer at a, at a time. And then the actual process looks something like this if you peer in the window. And perhaps the most um, notable thing is that as the laser is melting, there's a lot of what looks like a sparkler to me. There's a lot of stuff going on. So again, we'll come back to that in the visualization. So the net, um, uh, the sort of destination here is to be able to apply what you might call the classical materials tetrahedron to understand the processing so that you know well enough what structure you have, which in turn determines properties and therefore performance. But if you think about spreading more or less a human hair's worth of powder and then writing, then you quickly realize that in order to build a part of any significant dimensions, it takes hours and hours. In fact, for much of what we do, a typical print time might be two days or even three days. And that itself has some, some issues with it. Okay, so it was a rapid prototyping um, approach, particularly I would say with the polymers, although of course people are making real parts with polymers these days as the materials are broadened out. But the, the, what happened very quickly with metals was to very quickly jump to making real parts, actual final parts. And that's part of why metals AM has been such a, um, a strong stimulus to the whole area. And so you can make diagrams, and this kind of diagram of power versus scan speed can be quite helpful. Um, and you can realize that there are differences between, say, wire feed techniques that have very slow scan speeds, but you can feed a lot of metal in um, per unit time versus powder bed systems um, which where you can write much faster, but because you're spreading them in layers, you have to, the net speed, the net deposition rate is a, is a lot slower. So there's that aspect of it. Now, what I'm proposing to do for the next few minutes is give you sort of the, the low level view of what's going on with Metals AM, and then step up to something closer to what um, you might care about if you're, say, a production engineer, and a, just a very short prognosis for the area as a whole. And then I'm going to jump into some of the, the much more specific and technical examples, but going all the way to talking about qualification of processes. So there are a lot of words on this slide, and, and, and I realize this. So I'm just going to pick a, a few key highlights. Um, and, and I'm going to illustrate the point that um, I made some fairly, fairly basic errors. So, for example, remembering all that had been done in rapid solidification and, and, and noticing these estimates that the cooling rates can be as much as a million degrees per second, I found myself thinking, oh, well, this uh, must be such that it eliminates microsegregation. And it turns out that despite the high cooling rates, then the actual speed, sorry, let me stop that cursor from moving around. The, the, actual, um, the actual solidification rates are quite a bit lower than that. Um, and in fact, one is limited in, at the upper end in speed. I'll come back to that. And so in many of the alloys we care about, you still get the same microsegregation. And that's very important. You still have molin sokoka instability. You still have microsegregation despite the columnar morphology. And that has a lot of impact, um, which I'll have to describe another day, on things like precipitation sequences. So that's pretty important. Um, but the bottom line, if you like, not to spend too long here, is that grain structures, microsegregation patterns, dislocation structures are all there, but they all differ very drastically from conventional material. And as many of you are well aware, you typically want to use the part maybe with some heat treatment, but certainly not having to forge it or deform it in, in some way. So you're much more limited in terms of the, the total sequence of events. Okay, so now I'm gonna abruptly change gears, go from low gear to high gear, if you like, and just offer you some thoughts about, uh, more practical th thoughts about at least laser powder bed fusion which at the moment is the dominant technology, and say that 
um, it, it, it has a, um, it's a technology that basically should be looked at as producing high quality parts. It can do this. And from the perspective of defect content, then many of those applications are fatigue sensitive or maybe they're corrosion sensitive. So the point is, is it possible to print parts with a very low defect density? And my answer is, if you follow the process window approach, if you map out the behavior of your printing process in a suitable space, so at least power versus speed with maybe hatch spacing variations, you can do this. And so we've arrived at a certain sort of hierarchy of process parameters. And the ones that we know are crucially important are power, scan speed, hatch spacing, laser spot size, that's not so generally known, and some, some others. And you will hear a lot of stories about, oh, you should be looking at this or that aspect. They're not wrong, but you do need to start in the right place. Um, resolution. The typical laser powder bend machine can get a res spatial resolution of about 100 microns which is pretty good when you think about it. Um, and you can do a little better that in, that in certain machines. Um, the, the part size can go as large as, say, 50 cubic centimeters. But as I already said, it's very, it is rather slow. Uh, the material properties, if you just look very broadly, are actually quite good, provided that you take the, the trouble to print high quality parts, low defect densities but you have to also pay attention to feedstocks. Um, and that is a whole other um, story in itself. And the, the really crucial bottom line is you have to be prepared to change your design to adapt it to printing. And equally, the printing has to um, consider what's going on with the, the, the design of the part. And so I, I hope to illustrate that when I get to the heat exchangers. So what? What prognosis can I offer you? Where, where do I think that this field is going? I think myself, and it's, and it's my personal opinion only, um, that it's likely to remain a niche technology for complex parts. But it will serve this way over a very wide range of industries and application. If you go and talk to original equipment manufacturers, what we call OEMs, and you sort of poke at them, you will almost certainly find that they are using additive manufacturing. They, they may not be using it for large volumes of parts, but they are using it in some way. So for example, um, a colleague of mine discovered that a very well-known uh, health company in the US, from whom you will hear nothing about additive, was indeed had a whole team and was very active in this, just from a, a casual conversation with people. Um, however, having said that, if you want to build larger parts, we're going to have to use directed energy deposition. Now, most of us know this via powder feed, feeding powder into the melt pool. Um, but another a very important variant is the wire feed approach. And this was originally only available with electron beam melting, which had its inconveniences, like very large vacuum chambers. But now you can do this with wire arc or laser hot wire machines. Um, and it works. It, it demonstrably works. Of course, you're going to have to expect to do more machining of the parts that you get from that. Real-time monitoring is developing really fairly quickly. Um, you s we are starting to see monitoring methods being implemented on actual, uh, certainly on powder bed machines. Um, and I think there's a lot more of that to come in the next few years. Um, control of material properties is finally getting the attention that it deserves, but it's a huge topic. Um, acceptance of AM is still a slow process, and I think it's very, very important to pay attention to the education of everybody involved, not just PhDs. This has to spread all through, um, through production engineering, industrial engineering, in order to take advantage and understand it well enough. And lastly, there's a variant called binder jet printing. It is much cheaper than any fusion technique, but the problem with it is you then have to sinter the, the, the bound pr the powder. And sintering is another topic that's regarded as 
very mature, oh, people have been doing this for decades and decades, why do we have to expend attention on it? But I can tell you, if you go and try to find a, a model for sintering that is a validated model, I think you will struggle for the most part. So that's a, a brief prognosis. So now, if you'll forgive me, I'll dive back down into the level of material science and offer you just um, a few comments about, um, first of all, what does the melt pool structure look like? So again, this is mainly for the benefits of those of you who don't know the, the technique. Um, typically, you send the laser scanning across in at least three different directions. And so that means when you look at a single cross-section, you see a fairly complex um, overlap between the, the, um, the various melt pools. So that's basically what you're looking at there. Um, to the right of it in the center is the sort of grain structure that you might ex expect to see in a stainless steel or a nickel alloy. And I draw your attention to two things at least. One is that there are long, skinny grains growing up through the microstructure, but there are also um, grains that look fairly equiaxed. So we have some work to do to explain how those microstructures come about. Okay, that I think I can actually help with. But if you look at certainly some of the larger grains, and this is of what we call inverse pole figure color, which tells you something about the crystal surface that's exposed, you realize that the color is not uniform. If you, it's, it's shaded, there, there are variations in, in that color, which tells you that the uh, orientation gradients, and the only reasonable way to understand those is uh, as those grains containing dislocation structures, which rather strongly implies that plastic deformation has occurred. Well, that's yet another topic I can't explain directly today, there isn't time, um, but we can come back to it in a later lecture. And then if you magnify further, then particularly the FCC metals, you essentially always see a cell structure because of the microsegregation that almost always happens. So that's a very quick introduction to the microstructures. Now let me try to explain where they come from. So um, actually, thanks to, an in, to a collaboration in MATS, then um, we took a look at problems like this, where the scan pattern, instead of being the usual um, going around the clock sort of thing, was limited to just one direction. So just keep depositing all in one single direction and piling up the, the melt pool layers on top of each other. And so you can see the melt pool structure reasonably clearly. Um, these were experiments with um, a constant power, 285 watts, and then three different speeds, if you like, slow, medium, and fast. Um, and what you notice here is sort of an extreme version of what I just pointed out. There are, th and I'll look at, look at this one in the center, there are long skinny grains. And then in between there are really quite coarse grains and clearly with a different texture. So you have a mixture of the texture that you might expect, 100, because of the preferred growth direction, solidification direction, and something that I didn't expect, which was 110 texture. So where the heck does that come from? So what we, um, so my student at the time, Joe Pounds, has set about modifying a code called Sparks. Now Sparks is a kinetic Monte Carlo code or POTS model. And the nice thing about it is it for 3D simulations, it's relatively efficient and it's publicly supported. And we simply added texture, it, texture to it so as to, so as to actually simulate that 100 preferred growth orientation. And so with a certain amount of work, then um, the, the, that panel of three um, EBSD scans show you the experimental microstructures, and these are the, the results of the corresponding simulations. And you, and you can see also a comparison of textures, so the experimental textures in this block on the left, and then the simulated textures in the block on the right. Again, I don't have time to explain them properly, but you, can, you should ask me, well, why are they such different microstructures? And the reason is that by varying the speed in that fashion, we went from a very strong keyhole, and I will say a lot more about keyholes, to a deep melt pool, to essentially a conduction melt pool. And so big changes in shape, and if you recall that solidification tends to happen following the 
the temperature gradient, then you can perhaps immediately see that the growth directions are really very different between those three different melt pool shapes. And you can see these bits of melt pool here. And so you go back to these microstructures and you ask, well, where are those long skinny grains? Those are the grains growing up the center of the melt pools. And I say that because when I first looked at this, I made the cl classic mistake of assuming that the long grains were at the edges of the melt pools. They are not, they grow up the centers. And so it's worth looking at, well, how exactly is that happening? So this on the right is the example of the medium speed and then magnifying that and making a cartoon of it. And if you think about, and the build direction is up, of course, if you think about the grains growing from the very bottom of the melt pool, well, they can grow with 100 going straight up, hence the long red grains. But the grains at the sides are mostly constrained to grow at an angle. And that then immediately explains why you see this green color and the 110 texture in the bulk of the grains in between. Um, and so that's the, the sort of first order explanation of why we see the microstructures that we do. Okay, so, um, okay, that was the last click there. So moving right along, I finally come to the really fun part, which is what you can do with um, synchrotron X-rays. And so these were experiments done at a particular beam line where we had a, a beam energy of about 24 kV and extremely high brilliance. I mean, basically it was run flat out, as it were. And the point of the little diagrams up here and the micrographs is that if you do not have too high a power density, then you just have conduction of heat. And the melt pool that you get is um, a section through a circle, a semicircle in cross section. However, if the power density goes too high, you start boiling the metal. So I'm gonna show you the result of that. And the laser beam drills its way into the metal. Very important for deep penetration welding. So now if I play this little movie, if I can get this to play the way I want it, then, oh, well that was interesting. There we go. I don't know why I got the movie by itself, but it, it's okay. It'll come back. So what you see, and I'll have to play this a few times, is you see that, that quite sharp depression. Um, and so that is, in fact, the laser drilling its way into the metal. You can see powder particles on top, and you can see as the vapor comes out, it's blowing powder all over the place. And furthermore, you can see that the, that keyhole is leaving behind bubbles. Some, the, the, the bottom of the keyhole is unstable, it pinches off, and it's depositing these, these bubbles. And that's very, very important um, because what you then have to worry about is under what circumstances does this keyhole go unstable? And you can see that if you go quite a bit faster than was shown in that particular example, the keyhole stretches out. It's still there, there's still a vapor hole, there's still vaporization occurring, but it's, it's much more shallow and it's not going unstable. And so th the other point here is that under most circumstances in most laser powder bed machines, there is a keyhole, but it is not necessarily an unstable keyhole. So we learned a lot about that. Now, what you're looking at here, of course, is yet another set of images. And so I, I want to take a little diversion and say, well, aren't you using machine learning? And, and where does it fit in? So this is not exactly on additive manufacturing, but I think it's worth um, going through it. So machine learning is self-evidently well-suited to big data. So is big data relevant to us in material science? Not very often. We very rarely have access to millions of pictures of perlite or um, bainite or, or you know, whatever it might be. So why do we use machine learning? Well, it turns out that whenever you have a problem with images, then most of the time, we really don't know exactly what to measure. So the whole point of computer vision in particular is it acts as a very efficient featureizer. It figures out for you with these deep learning networks what is actually significant in the images. And so we've already recorded a number of successes. 
and I'm going to show you something very current, um, which is very applicable to, to AM product, or this, this particular example was done on something else. These are fatigue fracture surfaces. And the fatigue samples, this TIE 6 4, were cut in two different directions. So some of them were cut along the transverse direction, some along the rolling direction. And so if you stare at these and you didn't have the labels, I don't, I know I couldn't, I don't think any of you could figure out which were which. But if you use a certain fraction of these images to train a network um, and you ask the network to predict for a validation set, um, how well can you predict that a given image was from a transverse direction versus a rolling direction, the accuracy can get, the validation accuracy can be as high as 80%. So it's not a slam dunk, but it's doing pretty well. So I'm showing this to you to get you to think, maybe you know, ex um, exercise your imagination, that this is a pretty good example of where ML can really help us as material scientists. Okay, so moving right along. Um, I won't try to explain all of this, but briefly, what we discovered pretty quickly is that the keyhole depth was linear in the power, but if you trace back all of these, um, all of these lines, you find that they converge on a common point, a common intercept, and that point represents a threshold value of power. And as you might imagine, that threshold depends on the spot size. So this was where we quickly discovered that power and speed are very important. But if you're going to try to avoid key holding and keyhole porosity, you have to pay attention to power density, uh, which is, was not, I we claim, it was not particularly obvious to people. And so that was already an interesting um, finding. Uh, I'll skip over the, the rest of this in the interest of just telling you the main story. And I'm doing okay, I guess. Um, and so what you see here is somebody else's work. This is from Trapp's work, um, where they varied the power level at a constant scan speed. And look at this black line here. This is on the, the left axis. This is the absorptivity, the fraction of the laser power that actually gets absorbed. And notice how it goes from less than 30% to almost 80%. And so my conclusion is that the laser powder bed um, machine manufacturers basically adopted key holding as a way to get the efficiency up, to absorb more of the energy in a very practical sort of way. Um, and yes, you can model this. Uh, these simulations are very expensive to do, but you can match what you see in the synchrotron quite well. And of course, several teams have, have been doing this, notably Lawrence Livermore. So here's a Diving into the details, here's, um, I think, a key point, which is, I showed you the movie of those, those bubbles forming and getting trapped, but what's the systematic approach to this? So Kang Zhao, um, who was one of the team at APS, did a very large number of experiments at many different combinations of power and speed. And what he found was that there was a very definite boundary between stable keyholes, no pores, and unstable keyholes and forming porosity. Um, and that this boundary was very reproducible. Um, and moreover, what's interesting is that when you add, if you, you can do this on bare plate, but when you add powder, it does shift that boundary, but not very much. So powder plays a secondary role, which turns out to be the case in, in many different things. And so you can go in and look at it in more detail. So here you see an unstable keyhole, an unstable one, a stable one, more or less, and that was with powder. Here you see unstable, unstable, but this one is more nearly stable, and so on as you go to higher speeds. So this was a good news story that by looking in great detail, we were able to establish that that boundary at least seems, appears to be very well defined. And that turns out to be important because if you think that it should be possible to establish a process window for any given machine, then you have confidence that at least the boundary on one side is in a certain place and it should not move around so long as you don't change your machine too much. 
Now, there are a number of associated problems. So there's something called spatter, basically droplets of liquid popping out of the, out of the keyhole. Um, and those correlate fairly strongly with the stability of the keyhole. So we're learning more and more about that. But let me show you what this process window really looks like. So here you see a space of absorbed power versus scan speed. And we've drawn some lines on this. So the red line corresponds to what I was just showing you. If you're up and to the left, then that's a bad place to be. If you're down here and to the right, then your problem is that the melt pools are too small in relation to the spacing. And so you don't get enough overlap and you are guaranteed to get lack of fusion porosity. So there are two major sources of porosity and in between you have a good chance you should be able to have a, a space, a parameter space, in which you can run the machines and be confident that you'll get not exactly 100% dense, but at least a pretty substantial fraction. But for those of you interested in research problems, I can tell you that the beading up or balling up um, problem up here at high power and high speed is still there. We still don't really understand it very well. Um, it's an opportunity for physicists as well as for material scientists. And it's a problem because we really would like to keep on going up in power and in speed all at the same time. But the trouble is the melt pools stretch out. You have finite thermal diffusivity. And the longer the melt pool gets, the more unstable that can become in addition to the instability in, in the keyholes. So that's the really quick summary of process windows. So now to reconnect us to industrial application and why you might actually care about this from a practical point of view, um, I give you a very quick two slide summary of a major NASA supported project, we're very grateful to them, multiple institutions where we are doing laser powder bed um, printing of Ti-6-4. We're basically just printing these fatigue bars about uh, five millimeters on a side um, we are, of course, characterizing the defect structures. Um, we're doing four-point bend fatigue on them. If you're wondering why four-point bend fatigue, it's actually a pretty efficient approach to this problem. And the idea is to connect all the way from the printing through this crucial mechanical behavior to show that this process window approach is equally valid in terms of mechanical behavior. Uh, I suspect it will work out also for corrosion. And just to um, lend some very similitude, if you like, to my assertions, um, this somewhat confusing slide, I, I admit, is examples of um, SN results from the four-point bend fatigue. And the different colors correspond to different places in the process window. So if you print over here, where you have basically Swiss cheese, um, I hope that was an OK thing to say here. <laughs> then you get terrible results, that the, the, the alternating stress that the material can sustain uh, are quite low, far lower than you would hope for conventional material. On the other hand, to make the contrast, if you put your printing squarely in the middle of the process window, you get the result all the way up here. And I know you can't really read these numbers, but here we're, we're, we're talking about alternating stresses as high as 1,200 megapascals. And that is deceptively higher than you see in, in ordinary fatigue testing of conventional material. But that's because four-point bend fatigue stresses a much smaller volume than does regular push-pull. So there's, there's a correction to be made for that. But the basic message here is if you print properly, then you get equally good results as you do for wrought material. And moreover, you can even find examples of cracks starting not from a pore, not from a defect, but from something in the microstructure. So there's that tantalizing prospect that we can print things so well that we no longer have to worry primarily about the defect structure. OK, so now I'm going to change gears on you again. But I want to show you just briefly this example of high temperature heat exchangers um, because it's been a a really interesting adventure in various respects. So I should have put more of the names on here. We're partnered with Vinod Narayanan at the University of California, Davis, on the West Coast. So they designed these things. 
and reprint them to first order. So this perhaps rather unobvious picture is of one of these concentrating solar arrays. So each one of those little dots there, that's a mirror reflecting sunlight onto a central tower there um, so that you would be thinking of several megawatts of solar power. And you're trying to capture that with, say, supercritical CO2. So you need heat exchangers. And so what you see here are some examples of heat exchangers printed, 3D printed, in Haynes 230. And so the point of that is that Haynes 230 and then Haynes 282 are alloys that you cannot buy in the ordinary sense for printing with. You have to take the risk that you believe that you can find process parameters that will allow you to make fully dense um, parts. But the story here is that if you do the study in the process window, you can indeed find an optimum set of parameters. In fact, interestingly, it appears to be a sort of ridge line like this. So that's telling us that we have more to learn. But you can indeed get to the point of, of very low porosities, like as best, I mean, as low as 0.01%. Um, and from doing that, of course, besides printing those things, we also are testing the materials. So this is just um, the results of some high temperature tensile tests. And yes, of course, we're doing creep tests as well. And so this is the yield strength as a function of temperature. This is the ultimate strength. And then this is the, the, the ductility. And so the black dots are data supplied by Haynes International, standard material. The red dots are from our tests on our printed Haynes 282. And the good news is, basically, we're seeing the same properties. So that's crucial, that um, you either have to demonstrate that your printed material is as good as regular material, or you have to accept some kind of deficit, some kind of debit for doing that, and then you have to quantify that. So I'm extremely happy with these results because they say, yes, we think we know what we're doing with this. OK, so one last topic, I think I can get away with the timing on this, is to talk briefly about hot cracking. Um, and so first, I'll just show you these movies from the synchrotron. And at first, you just say, oh, well, that's three different movies of, of, of a keyhole going past. But if you look carefully, you'll see up here, there's this sort of filigree structure. And here, and here, and here, that's hot cracking. And this is 6061. 6061, as it comes, is notoriously prone to hot cracking. And so you cannot just buy 6061 powder and go print with it, because your part will be riddled with cracks. It would be quite useless. Now, I'm well aware that you can modify aluminum powders and do things about it, but this is the, the basic result. So we decided that we would try to quantify this, use the cracked areas to quantify the, the tendency to hot crack. We took a look at, in the literature at what models there are. And of course, there's the famous DRG model. And most of these models, Sinoku's models, or various ver variants of them, look mainly at the solidification sequence. And so 6061 is a material that it freezes sort of gradually. And then near the end of solidification, the rate of change of temperature with respect to solid fraction gets very steep. And that's bad news because that means that your mushy zone develops these long, long, skinny bits of liquid that are very difficult to feed. And that's a lot about where the cracking comes from. Um, and so we thought, well, it, maybe it's possible to take all this information that we can gather and do rankings on this. And so we took a, just um, a data-driven approach. Um, we gathered data for various nickel alloys, various aluminum alloys, um, and some variations in these, but basically to, to make some progress here, we started calculating Spearman rank color correlation coefficients. In what order do, do these different alloys have good to bad hot cracking tendency? And what we found was that we didn't do that well with the Scheil approach, but if we added a, a hot toughness, then things got a lot better, interestingly enough. And that was, frankly, inspired by what the welding community does. They have this thing called the VAR restraint test, which is a very crude-looking test, but it's what they typically use. So there is a lot of 
there's a lot of data on here, various um, aluminum alloys, nickel, some stainless steels. But the difference between the left column and the right column is going from using only the solidification characteristics to including this hot toughness as, a con as contributing to the index. And so when we looked at the, the competing indexes, then the first of our indexes had the, had the, the Shio characteristic in it, if you like, plus an extra factor for shrinkage. And you can see that the correlation coefficients are really not very good from the, um, the, the synchrotron work, somewhat better for the literature data sets. Um, but when we made a second index, that's the middle row, then we were able to get good correlation both with our own synchrotron experiments and with the data from the literature. Um, and we also checked um, Sindo Ku's rec most recent um, index, and that was really pretty similar to, to this one, however much more sophisticated it was. So um, I'm telling you this because it's also an example of tiny data. There are very few data points here. And yet, using data analytics can be very helpful for understanding what's going on and getting some idea of what's really important. So now I'm going to answer those two questions at last. So we're close to the end. You can, you can start breathing again. Uh, so the first question was, will AM revolutionize manufacturing? So I'm going to claim that in many ways, AM has already revolutionized manufacturing because it's caused many, many companies to reevaluate their choice of manufacturing technology. I don't mean that they've chosen AM in many instances, but they've at least been going through what they're doing and asking themselves, are we really doing this the right way? Or is this the way we've been doing it for 50 years? I don't think that AM is going to replace conventional manufacturing. It doesn't make sense. There, there are too many things that have to be made by the millions or even larger numbers. And laser powder bear fusion in particular is just too slow. Um, <coughs> plus the experience base is not really there. Nevertheless, there are some new technologies coming along that will at least address the area of larger parts. And so there's, in, there's a much better range of printing rates, much better range of deposition rates available. And qualification is still under active development. We have a, a major problem with inspection and non-destructive evaluation. And the ironic thing is sometimes hot isostatic pressing may be cheaper than, say, doing computer tomography. But so it goes. Then the question of, well, why do I claim that this is the best thing in 50 years? And I admit I've changed it from material science to metallurgy, so be it. Um, the, the, the current alloys are really just not optimized for these, these high cooling rates, not at all. Nobody's even thought about this possibility until recently. There is some alloy development happening, um, but it's not all rep reported publicly. There are reports that show that printed material, especially in 316L, is actually better, has better properties than conventional material. You can't rely on any TTT or CCT diagram because you know, the, the thermal histories are entirely different. Um, there is almost always oxide present. Where does that go? We need to know more about that. Fatigue is exquisitely sensitive to defects because it's such an extreme value problem. And is that true of corrosion as well? Well, that's something still to be answered. Tie 64 has had a lot of attention, really more than its fair share. So we do know a few things about how, th how that particular alloy behaves. But consider all of the different low alloy steels. I mean, there's this huge range of possible compositions and learning how to work with those. And that's just one particular alloy system, if you like. So this typical thermal history opens up you know, multiple new chapters, I would assert. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? We should do a little oh. transposition. Thank here. you, Professor Rollett, for a uh, very inspiring uh, inaugural lecture on the, some more recent aspects of, of your work. Right. Um, I'm sure there are some. We have time for a few questions, so please. Um, 
I should be very sad if you don't ask me at least a couple of questions. Okay. Ah, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the question was basically about what, what, what can you do with the energy input? And, <clears throat> and uh, this, this has a long answer, so I'll try to give only the short answer. Uh, many people try to link all that they observe to the energy density. But there already there's a trap because you can use the linear energy density or you can use the volumetric energy density. I don't object to using those, those reduced parameters, if you like. But what I have to comment is that um, you can get badly misled. So for example, the energy density will not allow you to predict the lack of fusion boundary. You, you actually have to include the layer thickness as well as the hatch spacing. So that's already an example of a really crucial boundary in a process window that energy density is just not going to tell you. Second example, keyhole porosity. Energy density can be loosely correlated, but there is no way that it's going to tell you where that threshold is for the formation of keyhole porosity. And that's why I made a bit of a big deal about the threshold in power density, the amount of power reaching the surface divided by the area of the spot. So those are just two quick examples why by all means use energy density, but please go a bit beyond that, I beg of you. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Oh, I'm hoping somebody will ask me the question about the mystery posed at the beginning. <laughs> but maybe we'll end with that. <laughs> So, other questions? Where in the back is that? Alexei? Yes. Right, okay, so Alexei's, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. So Alexei's question was, <clears throat> um, where does the plastic deformation come from that, you drew that I drew attention to in those EBSD maps? Um, <clears throat> and so I'll, gi I'll give part of the answer because it's long. Um, but the, the most basic answer is that when you, when you lay down a, a weld bead or a melt pool, then the shrinkage post-solidification gives rise to residual stress. And that residual stress is actually quite high. And it's enough to induce plastic deformation. Um, a a co-author of mine did a calculation on it, and I recently saw some experimental work, very elegant work, that confirmed that you actually see slip steps in the material adjacent to the melt pool. So I, I take that to be pretty direct experimental confirmation. Yes, of course, if there's a solid state transformation, then you can have a, a transformation strain, and that could also induce the same thing. Oh, I hope that helps. Okay, thank uh, you. Laurent has a question, Laurent? if you'll allow. Right, trying to climb up that diagram. Right. So Laurent's question was, um, <coughs> what can, surely we have more control over the cooling time and maybe the size of the sample would make a difference. But the issue is, um, the, the only circumstance under which the dimensions start to matter is when you're building a thin wall. 
but that's actually going in the wrong direction because you have less of a heat sink with a thin wall. The best heat sink is just solid metal underneath. And so the quickest answer is to point you to the classical 1941 Rosenthal solution where uh, you can quite easily derive the length of the melt pool as a function of the power input and the speed and the thermal diffusivity of the material. And what you find is that the thermal diffusivity of almost anything we work with is not that great. I mean, aluminum is about as good as it gets, but most things like titanium alloys and steels and nickel alloys, as soon as you're going at a meter per second, the melt pool can be easily a millimeter long compared to, say, 200 microns wide. I mean, they, they get very stretched out, which also, by the way, for the mechanical engineers, has implications about um, to what extent you could think about using feedback loops as opposed to having to, to do things via feed forward. That, that's a whole other discussion, of course. Thank you. So, uh, unfortunately, I, if I'm well informed, we cannot take questions from our online audience. Is this uh, that's correct? a shame. That's a, a pity, but uh, <laughs> the system doesn't allow for that. Um, <laughs> Nobody will have any more questions. How, how do we cope with that? Right, so the question was about simulating the process, particularly, laser, particularly powder bed processes. And the briefest possible answer is you can simulate, but it is truly a multi-scale problem. Um, you can think of, even if you think about modeling the heat flow for the individual weld beads, remember that you have kilometers of weld bead. And so that would, that would just take far too long. And so what is done, for those that are not familiar with it, is if you want to calculate the heat flow in a build, um, what's usually done, done is a lumped layer model. You take several layers, say 10 layers, and you lump them together and you calculate the heat flow as if you had melted just the relevant region in that lumped layer. And then you do another lumped layer and another one and you gradually build up and you can fairly effectively model the development of residual strain with that, although that is tricky because you then have to pay attention to boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions on the part and the plate and the tie down are not necessarily so easy. And then if you go back in the other direction and you think about doing full physics modeling of the fluid flow and the vapor and so on, that is absolutely not possible for, for full parts. You really can only treat that as a sort of unit process and look at very sh short time durations to do that. Nevertheless, it's very important to use simulation techniques um, because I think that quite a lot of the behavior that we see is predictable even though you have to make some fairly gross assumptions in terms of the, if you like, the constitutive models. Thank you. Um, so if there are no, is there a question? Yeah. Right, so the, the, the question was basically about to, I'll, I'll reinterpret it as <clears throat> how important is texture and how much control do we have over texture? Um, and we have some control, it's mainly through the scan pattern, as I hinted in that very quick review of it. Um, 
and, that, and some people, including ourselves, have done a little bit of work to, to, to calculate what anisotropy we, we would expect, um, but it's still in fairly early stages. Um, and you, you, can certainly, you can certainly get some dramatic changes in texture, so the, the team at, Oak, at the Oak Ridge National Lab have demonstrated some of those things. And that's basic through, basically through a combination of varying the scan pattern and the, and the power to speed ratio and things like that. But turning that into an industrial reality, I think we're a little ways off from that as yet. I have, I have hopes, but. Oh, I'm, I'm very happy to observe that there's still plenty of room for texture research. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I want to say on a personal basis that Many people know me as a texture microstructure person and are very puzzled that I've been chasing after defects the last few years. And all I can tell you is, <clears throat> if you want a technology like AM to be accepted, metals AM, and particularly for high value applications, which so many of them are fatigue sensitive, you've got to deal with the defects first. The, the, the applications people just won't even look at it unless you can assure them that you are sufficiently well controlling the defect structure. And then after that, you're entitled to start looking at microstructure effects. That's how I would represent it to you. So, uh, thanks again. And uh, let's give our hands. <laughs> but please don't run away because we still have a, uh, an, an, an after session. <laughs> right. So, uh, and I, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome our Dean, Professor. And while he's coming up, I will answer the question, which is, if there had been a pipe organ in this room, I would have been required to play it. <laughs> At least that was one version of the answer. So yes, we have to do some important things now. Um, some can be short, and the last one will be probably longer. Uh, first thing, thing, thanking you for your very balanced view on additive manufacturing and the, the very Thanks. nice uh, lecture that you gave. That's Thank you. First thing. Um, well, we learned two things, actually. Oh, yes? Well, yes. Um, okay. That additive manufacturing is much more complex than we would have imagined. That's the <laughs> first yes. thing. And the second thing, you really convinced us that you are a real metallurgist. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's, you, you, you warm my heart by saying well, that. <laughs> well, well, I'll explain why. Because yes. you behave like all metallurgists that I know, those from the uh, University of Ghent, the University of Leuven. I'm not <laughs> sure at Liège and, and UCL. But they present themselves as material scientists, and that when you scratch a little bit the varnish, you tend to find only metal. Yeah. Exactly. I'm proud of it. <laughs> um, Leo will, will also try to, to persuade us a little bit deeper about your um, metallurgy past and future, probably. Right. He, he will tell us some words about your personal achievements and your scientific achievements. Okay. And then the end of that. Um, of uh, that presentation, right. he will hand over the Franqui medal to you. It, right. it is a metal medal. It's a metal medal. Oh, very good. But um, I'm not sure it's... A uh, proper material. <laughs> but it's cast, I think. I'm not yeah, sure that's all right. <laughs> As opposed to printed. So, Leo, I invite you for uh, right. some kind words. Have to sit down for this. Yes, go okay. please. So, Professor Rowlett, um, uh, Mr. Dean, in name of the uh, of our partners of uh, uh, Ghent University, uh, Catholic University of Leuven, Université Catholique de Louvain, and uh, Université de Liège, it's my pleasure to congratulate you with uh, uh, the uh, recipients of the. Uh, international Franqui Chair. Um, we, uh, you were uh, selected for this, I think, uh, three years ago already, and unfortunately, uh, because of the well-known, uh, this was a time that uh, for uh, uh, most people of us, Corona was just uh, only a, a Mexican beer, I think, <laughs> and this has, has changed since then. And uh, yeah, but, um, uh, we have a proverb saying that uh, uh, if 
delay, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily bad, so we are happy to, to welcome you uh, here. And um, uh, I got acquainted with your work um, already in the late 80s, uh, I was a, when I was a PhD student, uh, and I got acquainted with your papers on Monte Carlo simulation mm -hmm. of recrystallization and, and grain growth. Uh, which have had a, a, a very serious impact on, on me uh, because that was when I wanted, decided for myself that I, I, I wanted to continue along that path. Um, and uh, of course, recrystallization and grain growth have are two keywords which have a, a very important, uh, uh, um, tremendous importance in your scientific curriculum. And I was happy to see that even this week we are working with our uh, master students of some whom are here present and uh, continue along this uh, same line of, of modeling and even uh, 30 years later um, these papers still uh, uh, inspire uh, young scientists to, to make their first step uh, in the fields. So that's, uh, we talk often about impact factors but that's really uh, impact I would say. Um, uh, in, in that respect, of course, you, you have published a number of seminal uh, papers on uh, uh, recrystallization, two big review papers, if I'm uh, uh, counted, and uh, of course, uh, not to forget the third edition of the monograph on uh, recrystallization and related annealing uh, phenomena, which came out in 2017, yeah. I think, and which is on almost uh, all of the PhD students' uh, 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 table, as, as far as, as I know, uh, for sure also on, on mine. And that uh, I, uh, you have um, uh, really uh, very uh, groundbreaking contributions in, in this uh, aspect. Uh, the point is that apart from your uh, genuine interest in uh, uh, metal science phenomena, so to say, you're always, you're also an, uh, very uh, interested in um, uh, using, applying very advanced uh, experimental characterization techniques. And as you have shown today in your lecture, you're applying um, uh, high energy synchrotron radiation uh, beams to uh, probe the, the deep microstructure, I would say. You've been also very, very active in the uh, development and, uh, of orientation contrast uh, microscopy, and, uh, which is still going on, and, and new features are uh, being developed there. So all in all, this is a, a very unique combination of uh, modeling efforts, um, uh, uh, metal science aspects, and ad advanced uh, technological uh, innovations. Uh, and in this aspect, um, I, uh, um, you, you, where our roads were crossed, so to say, because you, you have obviously a applied crystallographic approach to, uh, to metal science. You look with the uh, crystallographic glasses, so to say, and that's a, an approach that I also very much uh, uh, appreciate and uh, uh, where we have um, uh, uh, in, uh, during the course of years, we, we have met many times, exchanged uh, inspiring uh, ideas, and um, you also uh, were uh, present here, for example, three years ago in Ghent on the recrystallization and grain growth uh, conference, where you were the recipient uh, of the uh, Cyril St uh, Stanley Smith Award um, as um, a Lifetime Achievement Award for our contribu contributions uh, in the field. Um, and in fact, this is only the introduction to what you were <laughs> doing now, because uh, as you have indicated, some years ago you, you, um, uh, you, you, you entered into the field of uh, additive manufacturing and did some uh, very important work uh, there. Uh, you have shown us the importance of, of keyholes and uh, actually, you know, a, a keyhole is also, uh, it, it creates a, a bridge, it's an, uh, a connection between uh, two rooms and as I already said uh, uh, by the Dean in the uh, introduction, 
Uh, this is also the idea of the uh, Franchi chair, bringing people uh, together, people from uh, different uh, regions, people from international community, with what uh, uh, links us uh, together, this passion uh, for trying to understand uh, metals, metallurgic uh, metals uh, microstructures, and build uh, innovative um, uh, engineering uh, products for uh, future for the benefit of uh, society. So, all this uh, we are aspiring uh, to uh, to accomplish in the uh, Franchi chair. And uh, please, uh, to this uh, for this reason, we are happy uh, to present you uh, with the uh, Franchi uh, medal. So, um, this is uh, it's a metal. I don't know uh, what metal, to be honest. Uh, if, if you Maybe. want, we... we <laughs> Would you put it, it in the SEM form? Yeah, me? that's what, exactly. <laughs> 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 we can put it in our uh, EDX exactly. uh, uh, next week, and uh, we can check give it you out. The, yes, check it out. So, um, uh, congratulations. Thank you so much, Leo. So. That, was, that was wonderful. <laughs> I no results to reception, I think. Yeah, no, I know, that I know for sure, but the reception I was not aware of. Yeah, there, there is a reception. Yes, yeah, so of course, uh, it's our pleasure to invite us to uh, that. Uh, the reward for the, I'm sorry for the people who are online, but we still do not succeed in developing technology to develop, uh, uh, to download foods and drinks. Uh, but uh, for people who are here in the uh, uh, auditorium, uh, it's our pleasure to invite you uh, to uh, the reception, which will take place here in the Peristilium. So yeah, but before we go there, I have to review something. Uh, I went to the rector's office to steal his speech <laughs> and to know something special about you. <laughs> and I took the opportunity to open the secret lockers of the rector's office and to steal a second medal, just to keep you balanced. If you have one in one pocket, you need one in the other pocket. <laughs> so this is the U Ghent medal. It's not Franky medal, it's U Ghent. Oh, wow. I, and it's a sign of gratitude that you accepted to be our guest today. So thank you very much. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much indeed. That's fantastic. <laughs> You're welcome. So I hold it up for the, uh, for the, for the camera, right? It's my pleasure to invite you to the reception. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes. What you said. Was